The dream of winning a World Cup is over for Canada. A loss in their final group game sees the Canadians exit Australia. What went wrong? We will try to answer that question in the next hour because I have a feeling it's going to get a little complicated as we welcome you on into Good Night Australia. New Zealand here on One Soccer brought to you by CIBC Annie Petrillo. Jordan Wilson, Jess Lisi. It came down to the final group stage game. Canada's fate, as we know, was in their hands. They just needed a win or a draw. Sure, easier said than done. Anything can happen in the world of sport. And we knew that a loss was possible. But a 4-0 loss, I think, is what's leaving a lot of people shocked. So let's try to dissect this result for the first time since 2011. The Canadians do not advance out of the group. And for the first time ever, a reigning Olympic champion does not advance out of the group at the following World Cup. What you putting your finger on? There's a few things. I think I'll focus on two that have to do with football. I think Bev Priestman, there was a bit of a tainted game plan going into this game because it, was it wasn't a must-win game to go through. It was a game where you just can't lose. So I also think there needs to be a balance or there needed to be a balance of not park the bus, but just being a bit more defensively sound. And it didn't seem that way for the Canadians at all. And I think for the players, I think some wanted it. I think if you ask the group, all of them would want to go into the next round. But the beauty about sports is you have to show that. You have to show that you have the desire. You have to show that you want to be the better team. And Canada just wasn't that on the day. Yeah, I agree. You know, the desire part, it didn't look like Canada had the heart that they usually come out with. It, when they were down a goal, you didn't see them come out with fire in their eyes. And, and we spoke so much about that in their previous matchup. We saw them play so great in that second 45. But it just didn't seem like they had that passion this time around. I'm not sure what it was, but their mentality was, was very off. They were exposed a lot defensively. They were late to step to tackles, and that was their biggest problem. And I just think that overall their mentality needed to be better. And we can say it all we want. The coach can even tell them all she wants as well. But until you're in that environment where you're taking on the host nation, we've been saying this from the beginning, right? You do not want to have that final game against the host nation mean something because the crowd is going to be behind Australia. There were thousands upon thousands upon thousands of fans in those stands cheering against you. It's loud. Your chest is vibrating. And then they score in the ninth minute, now you're chasing the game. Uh, you mentioned Bev Priestman and tactics. Sadly, these are the conversations you have, especially after early World Cup exits. We had it around John Herdman, now we have it around Bev Priestman. Uh, because in the world of sport, it really is what have you done for me lately? Yes, she gave, you know, helped Canada get that Olympic gold medal, but how are you feeling about her taking the program forward? Um, yeah, mixed emotions. I think if we, if we want to call ourselves a football nation, you have to dissect things. You have to look deep into it. Um, with Bev Priestman, of course, to this point, I say she's a manager that definitely earns respect or, or has my respect um, and has done great things with this program. But if you want to push it forward, you always have to ask who is the best person for the job. Maybe there are different eyes that need to be shed on this, this program or these players to get the most out of them. Um, I think in a game where it, was, you didn't, you, it wasn't a must win, a tie would have done it. I think there, if we, if we want to call ourselves a football uh, nation and we want to go and talk about these things, we need to dive into it. And I think there are some areas that just weren't great from her going into this game. I'll be a little bit more pointed. Do you think Bev Priestman should be the coach moving forward? This is, a, this is a funny question for me. I obviously had the chance to play under Bev for both at the under-17 level as well as the under-20, and I have a lot of respect for her. But if we're basing it off of what's happened, you know, post-Olympic win, no, I don't think Bev should be the coach going forward. I think, you know, as Jordan said, I think new eyes need to be set on this program. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of these players came up with Bev through the youth program. She's seen them grow, and I think at times there's a little bit too much leeway given to people. You know, are you performing right now? It's not about have you taken a step up since you were 15 or 17. How are you performing right now? Is there better out there? A lot of players who haven't been in the pathway, you know, growing up, haven't been at the under 17 level or under 20 level. Maybe they weren't talented at that point in their life, but they've gone elsewhere and they've developed so much. I think there's a lot of people in Canada that deserve a look. And, you know, I don't think they're getting it right now because we are comfortable with what we have on the Canadian team. It's the same team that we're seeing out time and time again. New players are brought into camp, but do they make that final squad? maybe one or two. So I do think it would be good to have somebody come in and, and share you know, a new perspective and really judge these girls for the first time. When you come in, how are you performing right now? Can you bring us to the next level? If not, maybe there's somebody else that can. 
Should she, though, be given uh, a little bit more leeway because of that gold medal? I don't think so. I think, I think what you should always judge a manager on is how they get the most out of the group. Not the best 11, not even that 15, is how you get the most out of the 23 squad. I think with Bev, there are question marks going into these past three games, and it's obviously the biggest stage of World Cup. Everyone wants to win it. It's the most coveted tournament as a footballer, and all eyes were on you. I think Canada fell short. So I think, yeah, you're looking at the players, but you're not gonna change the full crop of players. Like all these players, or a majority of them, you'll see maybe in, in four years time. So you're looking at the person to maybe take this program to the next level. I would say, yeah, Bev is under some scrutiny, rightfully so, because I think when you're looking at the last game and just this group in general, everyone kind of expected Canada to, to make it out. And the fact that they didn't and lost to a Nigeria or Australia that have gone on, it's, it's a bit disheartening. All right, well, let's hear what uh, Bev Priestman had to say after that 4-0 loss to Australia. You know, that, that's something this team will learn from. I think these moments, as hard and as harsh and as gutted as everybody is, um, it, it, you learn these are the moments that make you. Um, yeah, I'm just obviously, I, I didn't come here today thinking I was going home, that we were going home. But um, these are the moments that make you, and it hurts like hell now, but we'll learn. I'd love for those players to be part of our Olympic qualifier, you know, if they might not have that stretch, but I think Canada deserves, they deserve to, to get this team to the Olympics on home soil. Um, and that's what I'll be pushing them. All the conversations I've had with every veteran was how crucial September was. I'm obviously still processing it, even hearing, you know, you say, could this be Christine Sinclair's last game? Ha breaks my heart. So, yeah. Well, that kind of goes against what you were saying there, Jess, because it sounds like she is going to rely on the veterans for those Olympic qualifiers in September, and she says they have to learn, well, they'll have to do so quickly because in a month and a half, yes, they'll be back on the pitch. By the way, Canada has not qualified for the Olympics yet. They haven't qualified to be in Paris 2024 to defend that gold medal. Jamaica, by the way, hmm. is moving on to the round of 16. It's pretty incredible. Bob Marley's daughter stepped in to help with funding. This is a team that had to crowdfund to even get to the World Cup, picked up their first ever World Cup victory. There are only three teams at this World Cup, by the way, who have not conceded a goal in the group stage game. Jamaica is one of them. Are you now getting a little worried? Because, uh, you know, speaking to people, these September qualifiers, a lot of people within the soccer community felt like this was a slam dunk. Based on Jamaica's performance, are you a little worried now? I would say so. I mean, I think at the end of the day, one of the most blunt things you can say about Canada is we can't score, right? You, you see throughout the World Cup alone, there, there's two goals that were scored. That's, that's very poor on Canada's behalf. And defensively now, there's been a big struggle for them. So I think a team like Jamaica who comes out and they fight from that first minute to that 90th minute, they wear their heart on their sleeves. They are a very capable team. I do think that they could put Canada on their heels. This Jamaica side uh, is playing with confidence and belief. And in sport in general, but specifically soccer that we're here to talk about, it's gold dust. Like, when you have that within your team where you feel like you could take someone on the day, that's how Jamaica's playing right now. And we don't know where they're going to end up in this tournament, but even, let's say, they lost in this next round, they still feel as if they can conquer things. And you're going as a Canadian side that, that feels a bit disoriented. I think that's a, that's a fair word for me to say. Mm -hmm. But then also, you, you talked about defensively, Andy, how well Jamaica has done. But just offensively, you have someone in Khadija Shah that has 38 caps, 56 goals, plays like as a lone striker, plays like she's one and a half people, like she just is creating magic, running all over the place, great 1v1, knows how to find the back of the net. I wouldn't want to play the reggae girls in a, in a two-legged uh, affair. No chance. Momentum does seem to be on their side at this moment, but in the world of sport, we know momentum can be a funny thing. But when we look at the, uh, the defensive side, you know, that is Canada's identity. That is what also helped them win that Olympic gold medal, and that is also what greatly let them down in that final game. Are you a little concerned about what has been the backbone of this team? Yeah, you know, I'm not really sure what's been going on. I don't know if it's a lack of communication throughout the players or whatnot, but it seems that they were very hesitant on when to step, when to go, when to stay, and, and those late tackles were really hurting them. You saw it quite a bit against Australia, you know, the, the indecisiveness to step out from Buchanan a few times. It, it's, you know, good teams are going to hurt you if you are hesitant in those moments. So, yes, I am a little worried. I think defense wins you championships, like we all talk about. I know this is a cliche, but goals win you games. 
kind of couldn't score, but then the defense is really what you build your team on. I think also, too, we talked about it a bit on the show, tactically what's happening. Like, I think we need to revisit Ashley Lawrence playing as a left back, not because she's not competent, but because of what she gives going forward. But I think now in the modern game, teams say, okay, a left back wants to go forward, and you're going to basically play three in the back. We're going to exploit that. I think most teams, Australia did it. Nigeria kind of did it. The Ireland did it to Canada in terms of playing in that space and counterattacking well. So for me, I think when uh, Canada played in Tokyo, they knew how to defend. They rolled up their sleeves. But I think with this team, they're thinking, oh, we got to score. So they got the balance a bit, a bit wrong, right? You're pushing players forward. Yeah. Then in turn, there's space in behind. So it's really figuring that out moving forward. I was about to say, I felt like Kadisha Buchanan and Vanessa Gilles, your two center backs in particular, because, you know, we, we often know that fullbacks kind of use them as that wing back. They will run up quite a bit, and that's why you see Ashley Lawrence up the pitch a lot. But I really felt like oftentimes Gilles and Buchanan were scrambling yeah. to get back because the ball was over their head, and next thing you know, they're in a foot race. And I kept wondering, why are they being so exposed? You yeah. just feel like they're playing too high up the, the pitch because they are desperate to get those goals. A lot of the goals that were scored against Canada in these three games were similar in terms of certain balls played in behind or, or you're drawing a center back and you're playing that space. Because teams started to figure out, and we said on the show, not that Bev Priestman was going to listen to us and start doing their tactics, but <laughs> it's what you can see. I think for me, when I'm looking at it, and Jess, we've talked about it as well. Andy, you've mentioned it as well. When you're looking, we could see it but like it's hard to, to adjust those things in two or three days. Those are just maybe frailties within your side. Um, but to go far, you have to have a defensively sound team, and Canada just hasn't been that. Yeah, so let's, let's go on the other side of the pitch now and talk about offense, and we know that they've been struggling to score. They get two goals in three games here in the group stage. Some would say they actually got one goal. As we know, one of those goals against Ireland was an own goal. Uh, how, do you, how do you fix that? What is it that you saw and you have seen from this team that is just not allowing for that kind of creativity in the offense that leads to a goal? I mean, for me, a lot of it is decision making. And I say that um, in a sense of both from Priestman's side as well as the girls on the pitch. I think, you know, from Bev's side, why not try new people, right? Chloe Lacasse, a player that I would have loved to see get a start, get more minutes. She came in a little late in the game, but she made a difference every time she stepped on the pitch. But for those on the field, it seemed like it was almost always rushed. It was almost hectic when they got into that final third. They wanted to score, so they were forcing shots from far out, or they were tr they couldn't connect a simple pass to their teammate. The crosses were, you know, kind of head down, just hitting it in, hoping someone would be there. There wasn't numbers in the box. It just doesn't look like a collective unit up front. It looks very hectic. And I just think that at this point, there's nothing to lose. Obviously, the people you've been playing haven't proven that they've can, they can score. So why not try some new combinations and, and potentially build new partnerships? Yeah, to Jess's point, you got to shake. You got you to figure out maybe uh, the chemistry within certain players as well. And I think as a manager, it's easy for us to say, well, this is what you should try, and, and then Bev Priestman is with these players all the time. But you have to find these little combinations that might work. I still think my concern is the same as it was going into this tournament for Canada, is what is Canada's identity going forward? Like, what kind of team are they, and how do they want to attack? I think after three games, watching them closely and intently, I don't really know. Like, are they a crossing team? Do they want to combine? I know there's a difference maker in uh, an Ashley Lawrence or Jesse Fleming. They can create something, right? They can, they can do a bit of magic. Hide him up if she's, on the, if she's feeling on the day or you have a, an X Factor in Leon or, or wingers. But how collectively as a group do they want to play? Do you want to live and die by certain games? And I don't really know. I think from what I've seen is that Canada could be a crossing team in terms of getting numbers in the box, but that's something that needs to be trained. It's not just one player you're hoping to score with three players around her. It's getting three, four, five players in and around the box. That's how you want to attack. But regardless of what Bev Priestman thinks, I just think it's getting the whole team to buy into that system and then executing it. And being quick, because if you're going to do that, if you're going to have possession, if you're going to set up, you got to be quick. Because I find sometimes Canada holds on a little too long, and next thing you know, the opposition has all their players back in the box. And when you looked at Adriana Leon's goal, that was in transition. That was Quinn doing some magic, getting it to Sophie Schmidt. Boom, right away gets to Leon. She turns on the Jets, and they're gone. But when they hold on to possession, they try to build up this play, it's just that one or two second too long that allows the opposition to get back. I think wherever they play, they need to fly you in because you'll be rapido, rapido, quick, quick, quick. <laughs> go, go, go. There's That's what they need. Again. <laughs> I'll just be yelling. Faster, 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 faster. Go do it. All right.
right, well, here's what Ashley Lawrence just put out moments before our show. Um, disappointed to be exiting the World Cup. Thank you to the traveling fans that made the long journey and those that woke up early to cheer us on back home. There's nothing more to say besides we were not good enough and we're sorry. We're going to be getting into that because a lot of people now are wondering if there were certain things happening off the pitch that uh, is the main reason for this team being distracted. And it sounds like from a lot of the players, no, they're not putting it on any off-field distractions and they're owning what happened on the pitch. Let's discuss next. You continue to watch Goodnight Australia New Zealand brought to you by CIBC here on One Soccer. The tournament may be over for the Canadians, but the round of 16 is just around the corner. We'll get into that a little later on in the show as we welcome you back. Andy Jordan and Jess with you. Let's continue talking about the Canadians. And Christine Sinclair afterwards when she spoke to the media did not put the loss and them exiting the World Cup on the shoulders of Canada soccer. However, she did take the moment to stress the importance of a domestic league. The reality with the World Cup is all but one team leaves the way we're feeling right now, right? So, um, yeah, for me, it's just helping out the, the youngsters, like helping them, helping this fuel them, you know, when they're moving forward, but also the youngsters back home in Canada, our federation, I mean, things have to change. We, we don't have a professional league. We don't, we don't have that pathway for players to, to reach the national team. And if this isn't a wake-up call, I don't know what is. All right, let's talk domestic league. And, and do you think that's the answer? Do you think that will help the national program? Um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. I think, you know, at the end of the day, we all know that these national team players are not coming back to play in this Canadian League once it is, you know, all intact. But um, I think it will kind of be League One, but maybe the best of League One, those players will move up and, you know, maybe new players will come through the pathway. But I don't, I'm not really sure if the quality will be there to be a pathway for that full national team. So I'm a, I'm a little torn um, in this. I do think that it's good, and I think more players will get looked at. Um, but I just don't know if the quality will be there for, you know, Bev or whoever the coach is to come sit there and say, that player should be on the full national team. Like, will that quality be there in the league? I'm not sure. Okay, so let me put it this way. Do you think then that it's part of the process, much of like we see with the Canadian Premier League, more for the opportunity for younger players? Because if there's one thing I'm hearing a lot of, and I feel like it's a pretty common sentiment, is that a lot of young talent falls through the cracks in this country. So to your point, you may not have the superstars of your national yeah. team maybe playing in it, but do you have the future playing in it? So, yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Andy. That's exactly what I would say in terms of if we're comparing the Canadian Premier League, but just having a domestic league um, in Canada. For, for my experience, when I played overseas, it was the fact that I held on the longest, that I wanted to do it. But there are so many other talented players that are right here at home. Jesse, you notice, we can go through a list. Yeah. Every year, you can go through a list of players that have the quality, but then maybe you get to high school, university, and it's just like, what's next? And what happens in Canada, if you don't have a league or if you're not in a system, it's, you're more inclined to maybe just go and work or stop playing or whatever it might be. So with Christine Sinclair, I understand her sentiment because it, it provides volume. It provides something that's substantial where, where players, young girls, young boys can go and play in a league and you can, you can have a chance at, at furthering your career. So I do think that's a part of it. Also, if you want to call yourself a football na nation and we're growing this game, you have to have something that you call your own. And you can see with the Canadian Premier League, yes, is, is Canadian Premier League players going on and there's a, a truckload of them on a national team? No, but all it takes is one. Then maybe there's two. And there's, a, there's some growth there. And that's only in five years. So yeah. imagine if you, in 10 years' time, yeah. we're looking at a decade, what that could do for... For the, for the women's game. Well, and I, and I want the conversations we have around the men's game to happen around the women's because how many of the men who play with the Canadian Premier League started off in League One, yeah. right? In their respective uh, cities and then they made the, the, the leap to the CPL. So wouldn't it be nice because we know League One Ontario, Quebec and BC exist for the women as well. Uh, and wouldn't it be nice if they then had a domestic league to go into? And we want more soccer. We want more sports in this country. Come on, we're all for it. We support it. Uh, when it comes to the women, when you take a look at their 2023 results. Uh, this, of course, including
in the World Cup. We know it hasn't been a really good year. And I know we can probably look back at the She Believes Cup. In fact, I can say definitively we can look back at the She Believes Cup and say that the Canadian women were very distracted by what was happening off the pitch. That was the threat to strike. That was Canada soccer responding with legal action. It was an absolute mess. They took to the field. They looked shell-shocked and I had a chance to speak to Christine St. Clair before this World Cup and she fully acknowledged that they learned at the She Believes Cup they only have so much energy to go around which is why they wanted to remain completely focused on the World Cup. Bev Priestman said while they were in training camp in Australia this is the most focus I've seen this team since the Olympics. They were dialed in and credit to the players they're not saying anything that was happening off the field was distracting them here at the World Cup. They're taking responsibility for it. However, let us speculate. Do you think you can look at negotiations, the ongoing labor dispute with CSA as being a distraction? Um, you know, I think obviously at the beginning, like you said, with the She Believes Cup and everything, I do think it might have messed up their mentality in those camps and they, you know, they were so focused on other things. But I think considering all these teams, I mean, sorry, all these players uh, play at top clubs, I think that as individuals, it just wasn't good enough. So I don't think that it was necessarily the labor dispute that carried over and, you know, uh, forced them to have a poor performance. I just don't think it was good enough from an individual standpoint. Um, and as a team, yes, maybe they could have had more of a collective thing going on had they had more training together and there wasn't any distractions earlier in the year. But I, you know, props to them for not using it as an excuse because it definitely is not an excuse. And I think that um, the bottom line is it just, it needs to be better. I truly believe the best athletes can compartmentalize. That's a part of the craft. Now, I don't want to say that and, and, and be dismissive of people's feelings because I honestly know that over time that would weigh on you. But you see athletes all the time playing when, when something happens, whether it be a death or someone's sick or even playing and you're ill. I'm sure, Jess, you've done that as well. I know that I have where you're playing on like a sprained ankle. Whatever it might be, it could be physical, but it could also be mental. But what I will say is that there's a dark cloud with, with Canada soccer right now and the contention and performance it's hard to go hand in hand. Like you're seeing contention and it's just a dark cloud and media or whoever it might be can always just point to that one thing that is just looming and it's just going over. So naturally, I know it might take years or some time, but it's still pushing the programs, men's and women's side, Canada soccer, into the right direction. Because then at that point, if things are settled and everyone feels like their best self, then all we can focus on is the football. So. I don't know if I answered your question. I might have done a little merry-go-round, but that's, that's just how I feel. It's a I'll, tough one. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this because I, I tweeted it out. It's actually out there. I, I just don't like when, and I know some people think they're coming to the rescue of women and they think they're probably helping push the cause, but they don't realize that they're infant, uh, infantilizing women and you make us feel like children or babies when you say, oh, they're there. There must have been another distraction as to why you didn't perform at your best. No just simply didn't perform it the best. And I made a point of saying, if we're going to you know, talk about equality, then you look at the men who are very much embroiled in the same labor dispute with Canada soccer. In fact, the men boycotted a game. The men, by the way, still don't know what's happening with their World Cup money. Yet when they crashed out of the World Cup in Qatar, we rightfully though, this is what we do. Should Alfonso Davies have been the one to have taken the penalty kick? Did John Herdman get his tactics right? Did he keep Atiba Hutchinson on too long? We had these conversations because that's what we do when we talk about the men's game. Well, how do you give that same equal treatment to the women? You talk about the game. Should Christine Sinclair have been the one to take that penalty kick? Did Bev Priestman get her tactics right? What happened to the defense with Canada? They weren't good enough. What was disjointed about it? Why couldn't the midfield connect? That, to me, is how you show equality. And to your point, that's not dismissing what's going on off the field. But like I said, I spoke to Sinclair and I spoke to Priestman, and both said they're the most focused they've ever been. So are you saying they lied? Because they claim they were the most focused. The questions I do have when it comes to the labor dispute, I question the timing of the men coming out with their statement, which was the night before the Ireland game. I don't know why the men did that. I don't know why they felt it was necessary to put that statement out at that time. And I know a lot of people say, well, the women came out with a new agreement. As we know, once again, it's short term. So they questioned why Canada soccer uh, chose to negotiate with the women while they were at a World Cup. We would still love the answer to that too. But what we do know is before the World Cup started, once again, Christine Sinclair said they wanted a deal done. So the women wanted a deal done. They wanted something to be done. This was 
part of, you know, their, their wish, their ask. So I don't know, it's all very muddy, but I appreciate the women coming out and saying, not blaming anything, we did not show up. And to your point, Andy, I think it's crippling. You already said this, but I'll just say it as well and back you up. I think it's crippling if you don't have that conversation, mm -hmm. right? And then also, that's the point where you grow. Just, you know, as an athlete as well, when you played, if you had a bad game, you do not want people telling you, oh, here, here, it was okay. You want the, I want the gutter, I want the truth. Mm -hmm. I want, look, your first touch was poor. You did a touch tackle, you gotta tighten it up because that's how you grow and get better. You're like, this was the bottom, let me pick it up. I like when Jesse Fleming and other players got on, on camera and said, like, yeah. this wasn't good enough. I don't, I don't need to hear sorries, personally, because if you go and do your best or you try your hardest, that's good enough for me. But we can always talk about the game and the performance, but that's how you build. And when we talk about a football nation, I know we're far from being that in Canada, but that's what it takes is dissecting the game and looking at those, those things. So I appreciate that from the players because that's how you push forward. Jesse Fleming, it was a bad night to have a bad night. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was, right? No, absolutely. And, you know, I think that these women have you know, earn the respect from us to have those conversations and to really break them down. Because as an athlete, to Jordan's point, you're your own worst critic, right? You know that was poor. That was a horrible performance on our part. If you turn around and start making excuses, then, you know, you're not the elite level athlete that that everyone thinks you are. At the end of the day, it's just a part of the game. You're going to perform poorly, and it's about taking that ownership and moving forward from there. And I think that, you know, we do know that Canada has a lot of quality players. We know that this team is very capable. They just have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what it is that's going to really mm -hmm. help them take that step forward and show Canada once again, you know, the team that we all know they can be. And figure out how to take their Olympic success to the World Cup. Because, you know, again, this is a team at the last three Olympics. They've medaled two bronze and then the epitome with their gold. But they haven't been able to translate that success at the World Cup level. So you see their best ever finish, right, remains 2003 with their fourth. And you could see they were eliminated in the group stage in 07-11. They make it to the quarterfinals. That was a home World Cup. 2015, uh, 2019 elimination in the round of 16, and now the group stage. How do you change that? I mean, I'll start with, I think the World Cup is just different gravy altogether. Um, no excuse, but I, I hear just chuckling at gravy. I guess she likes the, the, the gravy, the yeah, gravy no, that, reference. That good, yeah, I like that. <laughs> I like poutine. Like, poutine? Poutine, yeah. You're a super Canadian. I actually I don't, don't, I don't like, like poutine. poutine. Anyways, <laughs> we're getting all the things that we don't like, but I think that when I watch the games in Tokyo with Canada, and I rewatched some of them, because some of them I miss, bad me, I rewatched, and you're looking at a team that had momentum and they suffered. But in a tournament like what Canada just faced when they played Nigeria, didn't have a great performance, had a chance to win the game, missed it, that also kind of grows into things. Then you play Ireland, you get a goal in the first five minutes, you have to claw back, you put a 45 minutes together, that was a good performance, but it was just like, whew, you saved it. You know, but we never really had, Canadians never really had the momentum. And then it comes into a game where you have to be your best self and you puncture tires early. And it's an uphill battle. And Australia as well was going into a game and needed a response. They needed a win, but they needed a response. They needed a convicting win. One nil wasn't even going to do it for their fans. They needed an emphatic win. So they chased and they, were, they pursued so heavily. So I think it's also just about momentum that they had in Tokyo and the fact that they were rolling up their sleeves. And then in this World Cup, they didn't have momentum. They looked a bit behind the eight ball, just a bit, a bit sluggish. And I know that their hearts were in the right place, but their performance didn't equate to that. Yeah, for me, I was gonna say it's the mentality as well, right? Like I spoke about it earlier. I think you, usually when you see Canada go down a goal, you know that they're about to come out guns blazing. They want that goal, they want that win. And you just didn't see that. I'm not sure what it, is, what it was. Obviously their heart was in the right place. Nobody wants to go to the World Cup and go home. Um, but I'm not sure what it will take for them to kind of light that fire under them and, and, and get going. Um, maybe it is simply going back to the drawing board. Maybe it is taking this big loss and having to sit there with it and and figure out where they need to be better um, instead of you know riding just a high of winning the Olympic medal so I do think that once they figure out that mentality that we all know they have because we've seen it but getting back to it that will really help them continue to be great and, and take those strides
Once again, it's going to be a quick turnaround for the Canadians because they have two very important games coming up. This will be their Olympic qualifier to get to Paris 2024 and give themselves a chance to defend that gold medal. First leg, September 18th, that's in Jamaica. Second leg will be on home soil, that's in Toronto, September 26th. Both of those games will be live right here on One Soccer. When we return, we'll turn our attention around the World Cup. We already know the majority of the teams may making their way to the round of 16. Let's discuss next on the show. Time now to go around the World Cup because most of the round of 16, those matchups are set. In fact, six of the eight matchups are set. As of the taping of this show, it had yet to be decided in the final group. That's between Colombia Germany, Morocco, South Korea. Morocco, by the way, we know there are eight debutantes at this World Cup. They are the one remaining who could possibly go to the round of 16. A World Cup debutant. Moving on. Anyways, uh, let's take a look. I want you guys to give me your pick. First up, <clears throat> Switzerland or Spain? Spain. Okay, I'm going Spain as well. Oh, we agree. We agree for once. <laughs> yeah, but why? Why? I think they're a dangerous team going forward. I know that um, throughout this tournament they haven't always played their best, but I just think when it matters they play brilliant football and they're going to score a bunch of goals in the round of 16. Switch one of three. There's only three I teams. Like mm -hmm. Three teams who have not conceded a goal. Switzerland's one of them. Remember I said it's going to be 3 0 Spain. Okay. Ooh, that's it. That's yeah, a thing. I know, but watch. I, I think know it might be things. a little closer than that, but I'm still going Spain. Love it. <laughs> Okay, so we were expecting this second matchup to actually include the United States, but they didn't win their group. Uh, Netherlands uh, winning Group E. So what's more of a shock, Netherlands or South Africa who beat Italy? Doesn't matter, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Bigger shock. Ooh. I'm glad you went to Jess first. Ooh. I'm, I'm nervous to talk about Italy. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> you don't have to. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Netherlands just because Wait I think that we all, we all expected the U.S. to be there. And Netherlands is a great team, but uh, I definitely was expecting this matchup to be for the U.S. I did too. Yeah. Netherlands the bigger shock then. Yeah. Are we agreed again? Unanimous. I know. We're not going to agree on the next one. This sure. is very weird. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this one right now, so Japan, by the way, 3-0, group stage, 11 goals, 4-0 conceded. Uh, do you think Japan will continue to impress... Or could Norway, my dark horse, by the way, have the talent to defeat them? So your dark horse is going out in the next round. Japan okay. is playing some sublime football. I know, I know. Oliver Platt, handsome man on one soccer. <laughs> this is his team. This is his dark horse, horse Japan. How can they, they be a dark on. horse? They're good. Yeah, true. But no one's talking about them to go and win it. So when I say dark horse, yeah. like they, dark horse, sorry, they could go and win it. True. They're looking great going forward, and people talked about goals, but they're, they're scoring them. Just. Yeah, yeah, that was me. That thought that. I, you know what? I'm going Japan as well. I, I actually wish that I was on Ollie's side when he said Japan, because I do think that they can go all the way. I hate when you come late with the predictions, right? Someone what? says it, you should have backed it. Yeah, exactly. You guys are green. All right, so we know that in that final group stage game, it wasn't very impressive by the United States. They don't win the group. They are going to take on Sweden. There is history there. There is Olympic history there. They don't really like each other. Um, but uh, when it comes to this, do you think this is the most intriguing round of 16 matchup? It is. I think this is the one that I thought Justin and I would disagree on. It wasn't the last question. This one, oh. I think that um, Sweden are going to win in pens. Ooh. Okay, well, just for the sake of argument, I'm going U.S. Because I do think that the U.S. might find a way to light a fire under them and, and get going because they've been taking a lot of criticism right now and they are very capable. Yeah, you wonder if that, that uh, final game against Portugal, a bit of a wake-up call. I mean, yeah. former player and analyst right now covering this game, Carly Lloyd, did not go easy on yeah. some of her former teammates. She didn't like the way they were celebrating a draw, which, by the way, Portugal hit a post. If that had gone in, U.S. would be out. So do you think that was a bit of a wake-up call? She said the post was... Post was the player of the match. Wow. All right. <laughs> we... <laughs> Miss Lloyd. If you think we're harsh... <laughs> Miss Lloyd. <laughs> um, so we know that the hosts, so New Zealand knocked out Australia. They're moving through. We know that they're riding quite a bit of a high, right? 4-0 win over Canada to move on. Who are you favoring in their matchup against Denmark? Ooh, Australia. I want to say Denmark, but not, But I really feel Australia. I think that home advantage we saw when you played Canada as well, what that means. 
She's like, she's like a grade three teacher right there. I literally had PTSD. I was like, oh, you're gonna call my mom. <laughs> Taking notes from grade three. I was just like, oh, yeah. Are you a bad student? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. When she did this, I was like, oh, no. I went to the principal's hmm. office. I uh, gotta say Australia, though. Yeah, Australia. But they're, they're getting this done without Sam Kerr. Yeah. Now, if she's ready for the round of 16, but see, this is also interesting when a superstar player comes in because they can actually completely change the dynamic for the worst or for the better. We've True. seen this in True. sport. It's crazy. All right, lastly, hey, England. They turned on the Jets. We actually, the last show we were here, we were criticizing them for not scoring. They go on and beat uh, China 6-1. Could Nigeria, though, pose a problem for them? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Rashala, like, she's probably going to score. She's a handful. This team, Nigeria, we just saw it in Canada's group, can go in and slay Australia and score three goals. Like, they could, they could cause a problem for England if England don't put away the game early. Yeah, for me, you know what, I'm, I'm going England. I do think that Nigeria will cause them a lot of problems. We've seen England struggle with the pace of teams, and Nigeria definitely has that, as we've seen. But I do think that they will come out on top, so I'm going England for that one. Yeah, that, under, that underdog mentality from Nigeria, they've completely bought into it, mm -hmm. and that's dangerous going into a must-win match. Okay, so reminder, that final group yet to be decided as of the taping of this show. But now I am going to ask you, based on the group stage matches, we know that the Americans were the heavily favored going in. England was up there as well. A couple people picking Germany here. Germany, we still have to find out if they're going to go through. Uh, favorite to win the World Cup now that you've seen some games played. You know what, I said England initially, and I do think they still have a chance, but I gotta go with Ollie's pick here. I think Japan is gonna make a run for it. I think that Japan could potentially go all the way. I know Ollie's loving that right now that I'm agreeing with him, but I definitely think that, you know, I criticize them saying that they are a team that is always well organized, but they struggle to score in that final third, and man, did they shut me up. So I think that I'm going Japan. Whew. You wanna go before me? I was just gonna give a hot take. Because <laughs> no, you know, I'll go first then, because I love your hot takes. <laughs> no, I need to be no. focused. You wanna go now? Go now. I'll just say, but again, I just, the final group stage games have not been played in the final group. But dare I say, the way Colombia has been playing and Casado, Casado has been stealing the <laughs> show. Could you imagine? She's a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> the hottest thing is like, e my paper airplanes just. Sometimes you uh. need that superstar who just carries the team and huh? dusts everyone. That's to win it. Hot take. Oh, hot that take. Is, <laughs> Who's that yours? is hot, hot. Who's yours? Oh, man. I'm gonna, I said Germany in the beginning. This could be one of those things where I'm just staying loyal to the team that I picked in the beginning, so I could really pat myself on the head. I also think their pathway. I think they could do it. So okay. I'm going to say Germany. This is so much fun. Oh, all right, here on One Soccer, you know we have your footy covered. The Tony Bet match of the week in the Canadian Premier League has Ottawa taking on York United. That is Saturday. Kickoff 7 p.m. ET4 Pacific. Join us for that. Uh, we're not done talking about the Canadians. We're going to walk down memory lane a little bit. We know that this is the last World Cup for Sophie Schmidt. The last World Cup for Christine St. Clair. Let's look back at the legacies they leave behind. Uh, I, I mean, obviously it's hard knowing that the World Cup's over and just the way it ended. Um, obviously that's just raw emotion right now, but hopefully looking back on it in time, I mean, created memories we got young players their first world cup experience um, that will go on and lead canada in the future uh, but yeah right now it's a little raw well all good things must come to an end and we know for a fact that this was sophie schmidt's final world cup she announced that before heading on over to australia and christine sinclair without making a formal announcement she was seen taking a blade of grass and when she was asked about it by a reporter said well this is most likely my final world cup and she just wanted to remember it and kind of have a moment to herself because we know at the next World Cup, she'll be 44 years of age. Um, what has Sophie Schmidt, as we begin with her, somebody who scored a big goal, by the way, at the uh, W CONCACAF Championship, which acted as a qualifier for the World Cup. What has she meant? Someone who's had over 200 caps for country. I mean, she's meant a lot. You've seen her role change so much throughout the years. She was the player you were, you were relying on to help get goals and to create in the attacking midfield. Now we've seen her play in a more defensive role. But one thing you know you're getting from Sophie Schmidt is heart. She is not afraid to put her body on the line, and she definitely brings that leadership. She's a true professional. 
and that's hard to come by someone that's done it for so many years. And I think it's infectious in a locker room when you have someone who has competed in so many World Cups and so many big games, and I've played for club and country for that long. There's just a level of maturity that you need, and you can just shine to, to younger players that are coming up as well. Yeah, and you know, it's just, I think it's so special for her to have been a part of that Olympic team, even though in the beginning, it wasn't always the smoothest of relationships with Bev Priestman. I'm not saying personally, I'm saying from manager to player, she, she didn't rely on Sophie Schmidt as much as Sophie had been relied upon before, but she still was part of that Olympic team, got that gold medal. Obviously not the way that you want the World Cup to end, but Christine St. Clair, as we know, she's the all-time international leading goal scorer. By the way, Brazil bows out of the tournament. Marta, who is also competing in her last World Cup, she's the all-time leading World Cup scorer um, on either side. So we say goodbye to one icon. But when it comes to Christine St. Clair, who hasn't made it official, who hasn't made it official, you know, I mean, is this the final time we saw her at a World Cup? At a World Cup, yes, I think so. Um, you know, four years from now, she'll be 44. Um, I think that this was her final World Cup, but I don't think this is the last we will see of Christine Sinclair, that's for sure. That's, no, yeah. they've got to qualify for the Olympics. Yeah. Qualify for the Olympics, and then I think maybe at the Olympics, depending on how that goes as well, I think that might be it for her. But I don't know. This is, this is, these are the times I wish I knew her personally, because I'd be asking. I think she wants to go out on a high note. Yeah. I, I think that's what she's aiming for. Maybe another medal under, under her belt there before she finally hangs him up. So I guess we'll see. But We know Sinclair's always just shied away from the limelight. I just, you know that Homer Simpson gif where he just like fades into the bush? <laughs> the bush? I feel like she would do that because she just doesn't want her flowers. The pomp and circumstance, like get that out of my face, right? So even though we want to give them to her, we want to give them to you, Christine. And yeah, like I said, off the top, all good things must come to an end. But do you think this team is ready to be without either of them? For me, I think Sophie Schmidt, you know, we've seen a few youngsters step up in the midfield. You have players like Grosso, you even have Quinn. Um, Simia Wujo, we didn't see much of her, but she is also a player that has a lot of potential. Christine Sinclair, I would say no. As of right now, I don't think anyone has really stepped up and, and taken on her role to be the, the goal scorer and the one that people can depend on. That's hard to replace. It is, for sure. I think, obviously, when you look at both of these players, Sinclair huge in a locker room and for a team, but also Schmidt, it's just what I said earlier, just about leaders, right? And the presence that you have when you've played for your national team for so long and you showed up. And for someone like Sophie Schmidt, who hasn't always been in the limelight and has played games or started games on the bench and to come in, just a consummate professional. So I think these young players or younger players, like an Ashley Lawrence, uh, who's been with the national team now for a while, they have to kind of carry that torch and pass it on. And that's, that's just the, the succession of, of football. But to answer your question simply, I think it will be a big miss for, for the Canadian women's national team. Of course, it'll be a, a really big miss. But this is the challenge moving forward now is finding those replacements. And again, I don't think you'll ever see another Christine Sinclair, at least not for a very long time on the Canadian team. But that doesn't mean you don't find a committee that can fill those shoes, especially when it comes to the offense. Hey, are we back? We're back. Jordan, on One Nation? We're back. 7 p.m. ET every Monday? We're back. Yeah, don't call it a comeback. Been well, here we're for back. years. <laughs> but we are back. <laughs> That'll be every Monday on One Soccer. Okay, what is this that's coming up? Tasteful or Come on. disgraceful? I give you options. You tell me if it's tasteful or disgraceful next. Welcome back to Good Night Australia, New Zealand, brought to you by CIBC, bringing a show back, not by popular demand, but just because we want to. That's right. It was the game show on Good Night Guitar for the Men's World Cup. Tasteful or disgraceful? I ask you something, you tell me if you liked it or you didn't like it by using those two terms, okay? I'll start with you, Jordan. Tasteful or disgraceful? The expansion of the Women's World Cup to 32 teams. Tasteful. Yeah, well, no, no kidding. Okay. Tasteful for me, too. We agree. All right. I thought you were going to leave me hanging. Oh, this one, both of you are going to start <laughs> sweating a little bit. Tasteful or disgraceful? <laughs> starting Christine St. Clair up front against Australia. Ah, Want to go see? first? Yeah, you, you can go, go first. Yours is quick. Go ahead. Okay, quick. I'll say that was tasteful because I think she earned it after the match against Republic of Ireland. I see both sides here. I don't think no. she should have started. Hold on. I'm not done. I don't think she should have started, but I'm not going to use the word disgraceful because oh. she... It's harsh. It's a harsh that's word. Very harsh that's the game. The game is tasteful and disgraceful. Well, I see the tasteful side too, so I'm just going to say she shouldn't have started, but it's not a disgrace. That's harsh. 
She's a, it was a dis... Appointment? Yeah, there we go, something. exactly. Whatever it Gal was. got that. What are we doing? <laughs> I don't know what we're doing. All right. You were okay. involved. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so I see where you're coming from. Tasteful, came on second half, looked really good. Uh, but against Australia, nothing was clicking. She was one of the substitutions at halftime. So you could see where maybe... Well, how about this one? I'm gonna jump into this one because maybe this will help you a little bit. Tasteful or disgraceful? Zero starts for Chloe Lacasse. Disgraceful. Disgraceful. You got to shake some things up. I think she she earned it. She, yeah. We don't, we're saying that she's an off the bench player, but we don't know. She could be even better coming from the start. Exactly. Um, all right. So reminder: Canada, Costa Rica, as we know, are out. Haiti, they are out. They were uh, a debut team. Uh, Panama, they're out, but it was incredible. Jamaica, we know, are going through. So tasteful, disgraceful performance of Concacaf teams at the World Cup so far. What I, I don't really want to say disgraceful. I'm saying tasteful. I, okay. I'm just going to jump in there. I'm going to do a positive one. Tasteful. <laughs> you have reasons? Like, I'm just looking at the U.S. Mm -hmm. Like, haven't been a powerhouse like I thought they would. Canada's out. Jamaica has a nice feel-good story. Boop, boop. Shout out to the regular girls. But anyone else I'm missing? Panama? Yeah, well, that's why. So Panama, yeah. other than that stunning goal, which, by the way, they did lose to France. It was a stunning goal by Marta Cox. So they're out. Really, it's Jamaica yeah, and USA going through. Disgraceful. But here's the thing. You're right. Jamaica may be saving CONCACAF just because they're celebrating. They're going through for the first time ever. And this is a great time to bring in a little patois to the show. Jordan, take it away. I'm so ready for my Jamaicans out there. Forgive me if I don't do it justice, but I'm going to do my best. Una shoulda shiem. They're talking about the JFF football. Um, it means basically shame on you for the translation. But on a compound bunny shot, internet are going like on a radio. Oh. <laughs> Lego the ends! I loved it. So, <laughs> how did that end off? So, it's basically like you didn't support the women now, but you're catching on the bandwagon. Lego the ends is like Jamaica's gonna kill it, move out the way. They've been, the ends is like, ends is home, is, is yard, is Jamaica. Let go is like, let go. Even the way you speak, I just want to dance now. He really leaned into that. He, he did. He you know what, I, I want to be authentic because I didn't want the real Jamaicans to outcast me. Well, you didn't want me reading it. I, I would mean, have sounded like. Great, you say guan really good though. So guan. <laughs> Rexel, that's when you grow up there. That's what happens. You can say that. Jess Lisi, Jordan Wilson, I'm Annie Petrillo. It's been a blast with you, Canada, here on Good Night Australia, New Zealand, brought to you by CIBC. Enjoy the rest of the World Cup.